All right, we're going to talk about a little bit of pressure casting now, and I'm going to show you what I've had work. Uh, obviously, I'm not an expert. I'm just trying to share my method with you so that you might have an idea and be able to do it yourself. This is not a safe thing to do, so, I mean, just take precautions. Um, there's two very important things you need while you're pressure casting. First thing you need is a pressure pot, like this. And the second thing you need is a compressor, like what's behind me here. Now the theory behind pressure casting is that you use compressed air, force it into a chamber, and it crushes the bubbles out of the mold you're trying to make. Now this particular pot is intended for painters. If you take a look at it, it's got uh, a valve right here that shows you the uh, pressure going in. It's got this little screw here that you can use to control the pressure. You can increase it or decrease it, what's inside the chamber. Over here we've got a valve that hooks up to the compressor. This is where the air comes in. This is a blow-off valve. If the pressure gets too high or if you need to vent it, you pull this pin out and it blasts air out the sides. And if you take a look inside here, once I open it up, you've got a nice big empty area to work with parts in. Now the difference is that this pot was originally intended for painting, which means you put your paint inside of here, it would force air in, and see this hole in the back here, it would force the paint out, probably to a spray gun or an atomizer or whatever. What we've done is we have bolted that shut with a bolt, a bit of Teflon tape, get it really tight. There's no way this will give because the pressure when it's applied pushes in. So what this effectively is, is we have a pressurized chamber. Now this was probably about $40 from Harbor Freight. It's excellent. It will go up to 60 PSI, which is about what you need for pressure casting work. All right, over here, we have the compressor that I've been using to do this work. Uh, it's fairly industrial. Um, it goes up to 125 PSI. Now, if you remember, that tank, it's rated to a maximum of 80 PSI. You don't want to get too close to that. 60 is perfect for casting work. So, 125 is a bit overkill for what we're doing. But it's got a nice capacity, and I can use it for other things like cleaning the garage when I'm done filming. So, it's real easy. Turn it on and it'll compress all the air you need. And this is the quick release valve that fits onto the tank. All right, we've got this thing cranked up to 125 PSI right now. And the outbound pressure doesn't matter because this tank has its own control. So what we're going to do is I'm going to demonstrate how it works. Um, you've got your tank. I'm gonna make sure that all four of the side braces are tight, enough with two fingers, but not so hard that you break the clamp. Because I've read things about how these clamps will snap if they're under enough pressure. So what you want to do is just enough with one hand, like that. Now, this is a quick release valve, and this is its counterpart. I'm fairly certain these came from Harbor Freight, and I would definitely recommend them because they're much easier to use than anything else. And it's really simple. All you do is you pull this collar back, push it on here and let go and you'll hear that sound is the tank being pressurized if you give it just a second yeah this is clocked up to about 40 psi just for demonstration you can actually hear this tank the way I've got it set up it has a little bit of a leak that's right from here and uh, uh, it, I would honestly usually fix this sort of thing but the leak is good for me because it releases the pressure slowly. Usually what I do when I make a mold is I will put the thing in here and leave it overnight and by the time I come out the tank will be at zero PSI which means that it's not undergone any drastic pressure changes. I'm not certain if that's important or not but it seems the easiest way to me because when you come back you don't even have to pull the pin out. So I'm going to empty the tank out now. You just disconnect it and you'll see here this is the blowout pin. Now when the pressure gets too much in here, uh, when it increases too high, this pin will get forced out enough to release air. You can also use it just to release the pressure in the tank by pulling on it like this. And you hear all the pressure come out of the pot, and it's just about back at zero. At this point, you can just crank it back open again and remove your finished part. Now I'm going to show you the things you'll need to do the actual molding and casting. 
All right, the first thing you need is a mold rubber. There's two different kinds. There's urethane and silicone. So far, I've been partial to silicone, and this is by Smooth-On. It is called MoldMax 30. It is a two-part rubber epoxy, and it's measured by weight. Ten of this to one of the smaller one right here. So for that, you need a very tiny gram scale. Uh, obviously this is a bit of an investment just to get all these parts but it's the best mold rubber I've used and I've used quite a few. Here you'll see the resin that I've been using. I started using Micromark resin a while ago but I switched over to uh, Smooth On Smoothcast 310. There's a few reasons for this. The first one is that uh, Micromark's resin sets really fast. You have about three minutes of working time before it starts getting really goopy, and at that point, if there's any bubbles in there, you're not getting them out. So I prefer something with a longer working time myself to get it into the pressure pot. Um, and that also gives it more time to just remove all the air bubbles. Generally, you'll get better casts with longer setting resin. So Smooth Cast 310 is my preference. This is from Micromark, and this is, I would, I would highly recommend this. This is uh, an easy release spray. Now what this does is, is it's intended for silicone resins and rubbers, and you spray it on the parts that you do not want to stick to the rubber. Generally this means the original part that you're trying to cast and the mold box itself. This will let you pull the rubber or resin part out when it's time to. And these are simply just preference. These are two clear cups that I use to mix things in. And a bunch of popsicle sticks. It cannot get any easier than this, and it's super affordable. Go. Now the first step in actually making a mold is to make a mold box. This will contain the rubber and the part that you want to cast. Uh, I'm fond of using Lego because from my childhood days I have so many of these around you would not believe. And you'll see they make excellent mold boxes. You can make all sorts of shapes and sizes for any kind of part you're trying to cast out of. Now what you'll see here is that we've got the two parts that I wanted to cast entirely blocked off and ready for casting. Um, let me just explain what I've done here. I've taken the two parts, this axe and this axe, and sunk them into the clean clay that I'm using to mask off half of the part because we're making a two-part mold. And you'll see here I've got styrene tubing going to the top here, this side, from the parts here. And I've also done this right here with this bend that connects the two parts. Now the reason for this is that you have to always consider how you're pouring the resin into the mold. When it enters through one of these holes, air has to come out of another. So, you need to keep connected channels between the parts. This was poor planning on my part because I did not make, the, this is obviously inconvenient. Uh, if I were to do this again, I would probably move this axe up towards the top a little bit and just connect the bottoms. But I have a feeling this will work just fine. Um, generally what I do is I just place these little channels in here, mold them in uh, with, with both sides sticking out so you have these recesses, and then I just get an X-Acto knife and cut the little joints right here, here, and here so they connect to the parts. When you cast this part, it's going to be one solid thing, and you need to obviously do a little bit of cleanup by clipping the extra resin here, 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 and along these tops. Now what I've done is I've taken a couple extra Lego, put them around this outside rim here, a little higher than the part itself. What this will do is it'll create a wall for me to pour the rubber right on top of. Lego are surprisingly airtight in that uh, very little rubber, if any, will actually leak into the cracks created here. Uh, it's a fairly viscous substance, so you don't really have anything to worry about. Now what we do is we take the mold, and we take our mold release spray, shake it good, and we give the part a nice little spray down. Try and keep it away from you. I'm not sure how healthy this stuff is. And just make sure it's got a nice, even coating on it. And this is so that when you pour the rubber on top, you'll be able to remove the part and the rubber, separate them. Otherwise, they stick together and you'll never get them apart again. So just spray it good. And you get this little sheen on the part. That means it's about ready. The next step is to actually mix your mold rubber. You'll remember I was talking about the Mold Match 30 
which comes in two parts, this liquid part here and this more putty-like part here. Now these are mixed in a 10 to 1 ratio by weight, so you need one of these handy little gram scales. I got this off eBay, it's a jeweler scale, goes up to 500 grams, you will not need anything more than this if you use these cups. Now, the trick is, put it on here, turn the scale on, zero it out, there we go. and you got to measure carefully. Now the thing is, while this is a 10 to 1 ratio, I tend to just guess at how much I'll need to put to fill the entire thing up. I'm going to say probably total I'll need about 40 grams of material to fill this up, so let's mix 40 grams together. That's about So now that we've got approximately, I'm going to say, 41 grams of material, we uh, make sure you cap this up and clean it off. Otherwise, it will be really nasty next time you have to use it. We grab the second cup here, put it on before you zero it out, or else you're going to mismeasure. And we open up this wonderful little red stuff. you only need very tiny amounts. So I'm looking for 4.2 grams. A little too much here, so I'm going to pour some back. Four point three. So now we have our two measured cups of material and we're going to mix them together. Usually I just take the smaller amount because this stuff's very thick and goopy and it won't all come out and just shoot it on in there. Let it drizzle out for a minute so you get all of, the, all of it. You lose probably about half a gram in just pouring it down the side of the cup. But uh, obviously we're not doing very precise work. And you see now we have this red layer on top and the white layer below. Grab a popsicle stick and start mixing. When you first start mixing this material it's going to look really gross. But as you keep going, for about maybe four or five minutes, you'll see it evens out into this nice pink color here. Uh, don't worry as you're mixing about introducing any air bubbles into it. We're not doing any vacuum degassing, which is where you use a vacuum pump to remove the air. But generally, this uh, smooth-on stuff does pretty well for itself. And uh, the pressure casting itself will force out a lot of air bubbles, too. So you want to get it nice, even, and goopy like this. Now, we've got the part here, and we're going to start pouring this pink stuff in. What you want to make sure you do is pour in from a corner, preferably an empty one here. See how this is going? All right, and just keep the goopy stuff coming in. You want it to slowly flow from the side over the parts so that you reduce the number of air bubbles in it, in the mold that is. And you just keep it going out of the cup, nice and easy. See how it's slowly flowing over the part there? That's exactly what you want. There's a lot of air bubbles in it, but don't worry about that. We'll get them out in a little bit. And you see we're almost done filling this box up. I'd say my guess of 40 is about right in terms of the uh, the weight of rubber that we need. It's just filling out the corners here. And it's generally good to put as much rubber in there as you can because otherwise these will get squished when they're under pressure. The more uh, rubber you have backing the actual mold itself, the firmer and stronger it is. Then again, if you have a mold with an underbite, you generally want a thinner, more flexible mold. So you just let it sit for a minute as it smooths itself out. You'll see a lot of air bubbles will start to rise to the surface. Now this is a stupid little trick I thought I'd share with you guys. Um, if you look at the surface of this, you'll obviously see a number of bubbles have risen to the top. 
there's a couple ways of removing that. Honestly, I have a feeling that if you just throw it in the pressure pot, nothing bad would happen. They'd all get forced out, and the mold would be completely fine. But since I have rubber with such a long working time, I like to try and get as many out as I can. So a little trick I picked up here is just to take a deep breath and blow gently on the bubbles, and it will actually pop them and force them out like this. See how they all popped? And as you do this, you'll see more start to rise. Usually I do this for maybe four or five minutes before I'm happy with it and I throw it in the pressure pot. On the other hand, you can do it with the big boy toys if you want to, or if you find it's a bit too humiliating to be blowing on things for the internet. So what we've got here, a little spray gun. We're going to turn the pressure down. so it doesn't blow it away and you can just direct the air onto it and you don't want it to overflow but you do want to have it forced down enough that you can see the bubbles popping and it's that easy so now that we've got our rubber set and ready to dry we break out the tank and open it up. Take the lid off and take the part that you've been working on, place it in the bottom of the tank here, try and make it level. And I'm going to take this lid, put it back on. Now the trick when you're actually doing the pressure casting work always safest if you tighten the opposite sides at the same time. If you do one side then the other, there could be a tiny leak. You don't want to mess around with this stuff. So, that's tight. And that's tight. Again, it's just what you can do with these. Now you take our hose, make sure everything's good, and pull the collar back. Put it on the tank. Pressure goes up. I'm casting this at around 45. And that's it. about it. So right now our part is in there. It's under pressure and it's, it's hardening. And I'm going to leave this overnight. When we come back tomorrow morning, it should be rubbery, strong, and ready to have the other half of the mold cast. So let's leave it alone, see what happens tomorrow morning.